Hi everybody, my name is Michael Andrew and today I'm going to give you a free tutorial on the Canon EOS R. This is Canon's first full frame mirrorless camera. If you're coming from previous Canon systems, or especially if you're a beginner, it can be really confusing in terms of how to operate. So this video is going to focus on the operation of the camera and we're also gonna dive into the deep menu system and some of the customizations of the camera itself. Very important for me to note, we're not gonna cover every little thing the, we're going to cover the most important things. If you are a beginning or intermediate photographer, you'll be happy to know that I am offering an everything else you need to know about your camera crash course. This is going to cover all the missing links outside of this video, including the photography basics, the composition basics, the lighting basics. We'll talk about digital files. Then we talk about the real life shooting situations from landscapes to portraits to sports shooting. There's a strobe section, there's a section on video. You're gonna save yourself a tremendous amount of time and frustration in learning your camera. And no, not everybody likes my teaching style, but I try to break it down as simply as I possibly can. Now, if you're more of an advanced shooter and you're ready for speed lights, I have courses on the Canon 580 speed light and the Canon 600 EXRT. I have courses on Photoshop, lighting, advanced techniques, even have a business crash course. So there's plenty of information if you're lo looking to push your knowledge and your education further about photography. This video is going to be long, probably over an hour and a half, and it's gonna be hard to find things. So we took a lot of time to make chapter markers. They're in the description as well. Easiest thing to do is to open up the description and use your browser's find features, like Command F on a Mac. Type in the, the topic you're looking for. It should jump to that word. You hit the time code next to it, and it'll take you straight to that part of the chapter. So we pretty much have like this, this video manual for the EOS R, and I'm thrilled you're here. I'm thrilled that you trust me to instruct you. I also have a contest going on if you're interested in winning a Sony a7 III or a Fuji X-T3. If you'd rather get gear, we could probably work that out, I'm sure, if you win. We have a lot of information to cover, a ton. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's go over all the external buttons and ports so you know exactly what each does and you will know what I'm talking about later in the video. The most important button on your camera is the shutter button. And as on most cameras, this is a two-phase button, meaning it has two depths of activation. The first is a halfway depression, which you are going to feel as a spongy resistance. This is going to focus the image depending on where your focusing square is, in your viewfinder or on your monitor. Pushing it down all the way is going to take the picture. Take the time to train your finger to know the difference between these two positions. Behind and to the left of the shutter button, we have the MFN button, or the multi-function button, which will allow us to pull up a sub-menu to access things such as ISO, drives, focusing modes, white balance, and exposure compensation. Behind and to the right of it, we have the main dial, which is used to change our exposure settings. The button with the red dot is the video record button, which as you guessed, starts and stops video recording. The lock button allows us to prevent certain controls from changing when this feature is used. This square panel is the LCD panel, which will show critical shooting information, such as our modes and exposure settings. The light button will toggle whether we see black text on a white background or vice versa. The mode button will help us to select different shooting modes, including video, when we press the info button. And the rotating control around it is the quick selection dial, which can be used for adjusting settings. The hot shoe mount is where we attach speed lights to our camera. On the far left is the power switch, which turns the camera on or off. On the front of the camera, we have the AF assist lamp, which can aid the focusing systems in very dark situations. On the opposite side of the camera, we have the lens release, which we will need to press every time we rotate a lens off of the camera body. On the back of the camera, we have our EVF, or electronic viewfinder, which has an automatic shutoff switch that saves battery power when we bring the camera to our eye. To the bottom left of it, we have the diopter adjustment, which will allow us to change the focus of the EVF for those of us who wear corrective eyewear. To the left of that, we have the deep menu button, which we'll be covering in depth later in the video. 
This new controller called the multi-function touchpad can be customized in different ways to control different settings. To the right of it, we have the auto focus on button, which is also customizable and we can use it for back button focusing. To the right of it, we have the exposure lock or flash exposure lock button, which allows us to temporarily lock our settings in the PS or A modes or when using flash. Below it, we have the focus point selector button when shooting, as well as the magnify button when reviewing images. The info button will allow us to toggle different sets of information during shooting or playback for our images. Below it, we have the directional pad, which we can push up, down, left, or right. It will help with navigating through different menus and selection options. In the middle of it, we have the set button, which is like an enter button when navigating the menus, but this also acts as the Q button, which stands for quick menu in our shooting mode. Below it, we have the play and delete buttons, which as you guessed, allow us to show the images we have taken as well as get rid of the ones we do not want. The articulating monitor is touch sensitive, which means it is incredibly fast to swipe through images, navigate the menus, as well as changing most of our shooting settings directly on the monitor. On the left side of the camera, under the gaskets, we have the remote control terminal, the microphone and headphone jacks, the USB and HDMI terminal. On the right side of the grip, we have our SD card slot, and on the bottom of the camera, we have our battery port and our contact cover, which will allow us to attach a battery grip. New to the EOS R mounts system are the R lenses, which have a control ring, in this case on the 24 to 105 near the front of the lens. This can be customized to change exposure or ISO settings in the deep menu. We also have a stabilizer on off switch as well as an autofocus manual focus switch. And there's also a lock switch on the other side of this particular lens. So that's an overview of the camera's external buttons and ports with an introduction of the names and a short summary of what they do. If you ever forget which button does what, just come on back and we'll go over it again. Now let's go into an overview of how to operate and control the camera. Let me show you a little bit about the LCD panel on the top of the camera. Normally it's white text on black background. In the light bulb feature, if you push and hold it, it'll swap that around. I, I think sometimes this is a little bit easier to see. This is the mode that we're in. Shutter speed, aperture, so it goes back. Here's our ISO, battery life remaining. Tap shutter button, here's our exposure compensation bar. In the manual mode, this is a light meter. If we press, and this is real important, is the multi-function button here has a lot of features built into it because when you push that, we're given a number of items. And the idea is that we can use the rear control wheel or the quick control wheel to toggle through the different options. And then we're given the current setting on the top as you change it with your main command dial. So real quick coming through these, let's go through them real quick. So we have our ISO settings. So if you wanted to change your ISO, you push MFN, come up here, dial in your ISO. Drive, which is what the camera does after we push the shutter button down all the way. We have single, timer, 10 second timer, multiple bursts, high speed bursts, and back to single. We have our focusing mode, which is either one shot, which is a focus lock, or servo for tracking. We have our white balance. It's on auto white balance right now. Short answer on white balance is that you're going to want to dial it in if the colors of the image look a little blue or, or yellowish. That's where you'd come in and do it. See, likes to go back to that black background. Here's the sun icon shade, cloud cover, tungsten light, fluorescent light, flash, custom white balance, Kelvin white balance, and back to auto white balance. If you're a pure beginner or intermediate photographer and you're struggling with you know exposure settings, just leave it on auto white balance for now. Exposure compensation we'll be talking about in depth a little bit later, but that is the multi-function button and some of the menu items that it controls. In order to change the modes that we're shooting in, we push the mode button. We can come through aperture priority mode, shutter priority mode, program mode, FE mode, 
the dummy mode, and then we have our custom modes, and I'll be talking about, oh, and bulb. On bulb mode, we push and hold the shutter button down, and you can see we get a timer here that's counting how long the exposure is, and when we let it up, it takes the picture. Most high-end cameras have a bulb mode, and then we're back to manual. If you're a pure beginner, I would recommend starting off with maybe program mode until you get the swing of most everything, but really try to make the jump to aperture priority mode as soon as possible because you're going to get more bang for your buck here. 95, 98% of my shooting is done between aperture priority mode and manual mode. Anything event-like, outdoors, changing lighting conditions, I'm in aperture priority mode. If I'm shooting a landscape, some portraits with backlight, studio shooting, I'm in manual. So aperture priority mode is going to get you off on the right start and we'll be talking about exposure control in each of those modes later on in the video. So real quick, let me show you a couple things. We have our zoom ring right here on the lens barrel. We have our manual focus ring, and then we have the new control ring that is going to be found, it appears on most EOS R mount lenses. This can be customized in different ways. So when we're looking at the back monitor, just keep in mind that much of this is mirrored in the EVF. Some things that you won't see, obviously, are these touch indicator boxes that you see, these black boxes. That means if you touch on that, it'll do something. Very important to get comfortable pushing the info button and toggling different sets of information. So here it would be just mostly the focusing square. This is the back info panel. And you'll notice that here we only have the Q screen, the Q button highlighted. We can come in here and change shutter speed and aperture, very easy. And I think in, the, in this design at least, the EOS R, Canon is saying that most of the settings can be changed on the back monitor. We have this beautiful overlay. Let's go through the, this quick info screen real quick. We have the mode that we're shooting in, shutter speed, aperture, ISO. This is our exposure compensation bar. In the case of manual mode, it's a light meter. We have our picture styles, auto white balance, auto light optimizer, our Wi-Fi signal, button customization. We have the focusing square that we're using, the focusing mode that we're using. We have the metering mode, the drive mode, which is what the camera does after you push a shutter button down all the way. We have our image quality, battery life, number of shots remaining on our memory card. To change any of these settings, you can push the Q button here or the Q button on our directional pad. We can Hit again and again, touch and drag if you want to change the aperture. It's very nice. Very, very intuitive. It's one of the easier systems to learn. And we've got a couple new highlights here. Flash exposure compensation. We have white balance shift in bracketing, something I don't use a whole lot of. So that is the back information display. We can leave by pushing it here. Pushing the info button again. We'll take us to the next screen where we get our basic settings and we get all of our camera settings and we get a histogram and electronic level. So let's talk about some of these other settings that we can change in here. ISO, obviously pretty important. Flash exposure compensation is a fancy way of changing your flash brightness. That's what it means. Exposure means brightness. Picture styles essentially allow us to give recipes to the camera so when the camera captures an image, it's raw data. Picture styles is the recipe of cooking that raw data into the final JPEG image. Typically beginners are going to be on standard or auto. We have portrait, landscape, fine detail, neutral, faithful, monochrome. Then we have some user styles. And these recipes are a little bit different depending on which one you select. For example, landscape might be more vivid greens and blues. Portrait maybe have better flesh tones. I think flesh tones on Canon cameras are actually pretty amazing. If you're a pure beginner, leave it on auto. But if you want to dig deeper into this rabbit hole, you can push the info detail set. And we could tweak the individual settings for each of these recipes. So sharpness strength, for example. The sharpness fineness and the threshold. Then we have our contrast, saturation, color tone. I would say... Probably not a good idea to mess with these in the beginning. 
videographers are more likely to come in here and, and set them specifically the way they want because they're shooting JPEG videos and they want to get it right in camera. And that's what I recommend is try to get it right in camera if you can. If, if in doubt, shoot in RAW. RAW has a lot more information. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. White balance, we've talked about a little bit. And the short answer on this is auto white balance for now. If you see something funky like yellow or blue when you go to different lighting conditions, try to line up the icon with the light that you're shooting in. And you can see that as I'm scrolling through here, we're getting different colors on the display from yellowish to bluish. And the longer answer on this is that our eyes are very good at adjusting to different light sources. And each light source is rated on something called the Kelvin scale. Kelvin ranges from 1000 to 10,000, with 1000 being very yellow and 10,000 being very blue. And so what happens is, is when we go up or down on the Kelvin scale, the camera does the opposite of whatever light we're shooting in. So if we're shooting in, let's say candlelight, very yellow light, and we put it on Kelvin 2500, the camera is going to counterbalance that with a blue hue. That's how the white balance is working. And there's some other colors involved as well, but for the most it's either blue or yellow. If we were shooting in a very blue type of light, let's say sunset, sun's gone down, 7,000 Kelvin, we turn it up to that temperature, the camera is going to counterbalance it with a very yellow light. There's a philosophy and science behind white balance. It's essentially that scientists can measure the wavelengths of light created by different light sources and they, those each have a specific temperature, the Kelvin. Let me demonstrate. So videographers, I use the Kelvin setting a lot to dial it in specifically. Daylight, uh, strobe light, sunlight, 5600 Kelvin, very common, very typical. And it helps to memorize some of these. You know, the, the main important one is obviously 5600 for daylight. And as we go lower, Depending on what, what you're shooting in, this can be tungsten light. It could be 3400, 3200. 30, it's far more yellow. If you are shooting in mixed lighting conditions, I would recommend going with custom white balance. The way this works is we have to come into our deep menu. I love the touch screen. We're talking about this in depth. We come to custom white balance on the fourth page of the first tab, and we push the set button. And it's asking, do we want to use the white balance data from this image for custom white balance? We hit yes. We have to make sure we're in the custom white balance mode. And then what that does is it tells the camera what white is. So the camera understands that if we're in mixed lighting conditions, this is white and it's able to dial it in more accurately. Very common when I was shooting weddings that we'd have mixed light you know, at the reception hall or whatever, and I would take a picture of the bride's dress and, and dial it in that way because none of the other settings were really working. You can use walls, anything that's neutral and should be gray, gray to whitish. I usually prefer white. White balance shift and bracket allows us to shift the color balance in a different direction. Blue, green, amber, magenta. I almost never use it. Canon's color science is too good. In fact, I don't remember the last time I used this on a Canon camera. Auto light optimizer is an auto contrast feature. For the most part, I leave it turned off almost completely, but in the manual and bulb modes, it's grayed out. If we were on an aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode, we'd have access. We'll talk about the Wi-Fi in a later lesson. We have our customization control. There's so many ways to customize it. If we want to customize our buttons, we can come in here and you'll see that on the camera, we get a white highlight depending on which button we're selecting. If we wanted to change that button, let's say we wanted to go with bat, back button focusing and we wanted to take focusing off of the halfway shutter button depression, we would come to metering only. And so that halfway shutter button depression would start metering the scene. We hit OK. And let's say we wanted to, I don't know, go with back button focusing only. Looks like it's set up already. So if we were sport shooting and we wanted to use the AF on button, 
you know, completely for focusing it's set up that way. If you wanted to change that setting to something else, you see all the options we have in here? So many of them. Highly customizable. It really is. And we also have those options for the dials. If you're looking to change the customization for the control ring on your lens, I have mine set up to ISO. Let me demonstrate this real quick. So the way this works is I'm going to hold the little star button down and then I can rotate the control ring and it changes my ISO. If I lift up on the exposure button and rotate the control ring, nothing happens. Sort of like a safety mechanism. And you can see we can use it for aperture, shutter speed, exposure compensation, ISO, you know, without the without the safety button being turned on. I'm gonna leave it on ISO for now because I like having a direct ISO control without going through the MFN button. The multifunction bar can also be customized in different ways, depending on whether we're in a shooting mode or playback mode. Right now I have it set up for ISO speed. And there's three different ways we can control it, whether we're sliding left to right or tapping. That's what these other guys designate. If we tap to the left, it's going to, going to turn the ISO in one direction. It's going to reduce it. Tap to the right, it's going to increase it. So if you come into this menu here, you can see all the different options that the multifunction bar will allow us to change. Focusing, movie recording, if we were to come in here, we could have access to, let's say, the, the microphone. If we wanted to have it to be the headset, things of that nature. I have mixed feelings about the MFN bar. And for now, I am probably going to leave it on not assigned because what happens is when I grip the camera and my thumb goes over this right side of it, I don't want to activate a setting and, and change my settings, but maybe that'll change just for now. We also have this info full cover setting. So if you come in here and you select this, it means we, when we cover the entire bar for one second, it would display this setting screen. So I'll just demonstrate that real quick. Push and hold. Not really a huge fan of that, so I'm gonna leave it turned off. A couple quick shortcut notes I wanna make is that if you have the MFN bar turned off and you put your finger on it and touch it or tap it like this, Sometimes you get this, it's gonna say, hey, this isn't assigned, you're touching it, what's going on? If you don't want that to appear, hit, hit that. And then it shouldn't happen again. Another thing I wanna point out is this button right here, this little square on it, this can be used as a direct focus square selector toggle. So you don't have to go in through the Q button, you can just come here. It's a little bit faster, it's a nice little shortcut. If you wanna zoom in, you can do so directly from there as well. You notice we have the 5X, 10X magnification by pushing this info button here. So let's talk about the drive mode, which is what the camera does after we push the shutter button down all the way. We saw it on the top LCD. Same things in here. We have our high speed continuous, low speed continuous, 10 second timer, two second timer. Image quality refers to how the file is being saved to the memory card. So if you want to capture the original raw data, you would come up and select raw or compact raw. It's a smaller file size. See how it changes the number of shots remaining. Let's take the JPEGs off to demonstrate that. See, it's almost twice, twice the size. If you want to shoot JPEG only, you would come down and choose one of these two guys. L refers to the full-size resolution. We have our total number of megapixels, and as we scroll down, we can see that we go to 13 megapixels. And then the small files are 7.5 megapixels, and finally a 3.8 megapixel image, and we get the resolution and the number of shots remaining for those file sizes. Some of you are probably wondering what the difference is between smooth wedge and jagged stair-stepping wedge. That has to do with file compression. And file compression means that the camera is going to look at adjacent pixels, and if they're close enough, it's, it's going to say, hey, these are the same. And it'll make them the same color, and it'll throw away some data to save some space. It's very hard to see with the naked eye. And so 
back in the day when I was shooting weddings and you'd be taking 5,000 images, look at the file space, almost half the size again. And so smaller file sizes upload faster and they're easier to work with. And so in the wedding industry, there are a number of very high-end wedding photographers who would shoot specifically in Jagged L because it, it increased their workflow. And most people can't see the difference anyway. If you're a pure beginner and you're worried about this, just shoot on Smooth L. If you want to downsize images, you can do that no problem in post. A lot harder to go from small images to large images. If you're shooting something important, page shoot, your daughter's graduation pictures, you're probably going to want to shoot in RAW. Um, you can shoot in both RAW and JPEG just because it's going to capture more data. You can change the white balance. You can push the files much further in RAW. For now, we're just going to leave it on JPEG Smooth. Before we get into the exposure lesson, I want to show you some more overlay details. So in this screen, we have our shutter speed, our aperture, exposure compensation bar, and our ISO bar. Magnif magnification feature, touch to focus feature. Again, we have our manual mode, the number of shots remaining. This is our buffer indicator, how many shots we can take. See that countdown as you're shooting in burst mode. We have the video file size if we were to start recording here, battery life indicator, and again, our Q button, which we'll talk about in a second. Kind of want to go through some, some of the rest of these. These icons we can change in the quick screen mode, and we'll talk about each of them, but some of these you're going to recognize as the auto focusing square or cluster focusing mode, whether it's once or continuous focus, drive or release modes, which is what the camera does after you push a shutter button down all the way, metering modes, flicker control. Here we have our quality, white balance, picture styles, Auto light optimizer, full size sensor indicator. It'll designate whether we're shooting in a crop mode or we're using all the sensor. Exposure simulation is on, which is what I recommend. We have our magnifying glass and again, our Wi-Fi signal. So if we want to change these settings, we would push either the Q button or this Q icon. And it takes us in to this quick menu overlay where we can change each of these individually. We'll be talking about focusing modes in depth a little bit later. Talked about the drives, metering modes we'll cover later. Anti-flicker shooting detection simply means is that when we're shooting in certain types of light, fluorescent light, mercury-based light, there's a pulse. And we can't see it with the human eye, but the camera can detect it and shoot in such a way that it we don't notice it from shot to shot. If you turn this off and you shoot street lamps a lot, you'll notice that the color even changes. It's pretty interesting. Everything else... There's the cropping, so it's the full sensor. We can go to a crop, 1.6 crop. This is what we're going to be shooting at about, more or less, when we're shooting video 4K. We have our one-to-one -one aspect ratio, Instagram, right? Four, four to three, and cinema is six, 16 to nine. So that is some of this overlay information. Again, we're taken back through these cycles. Something else I want to point out is that if we push the mode button down, we can scroll through each of the modes. So my thought on this is that in order to get into the movie mode settings, it wants us to push the info button. See that? Toggling the info button will, will allow us to go from a stills mode to a video mode. And the short answer on video mode is I almost always shoot on manual exposure mode. I don't use aperture. I don't use anything else when I'm shooting video because you have the most control in manual and I don't want the camera changing settings from shot to shot. So if we're, we're on the video mode and we come back out, you're going to notice that we have some settings that have changed. We're given this servo autofocus indicator, which means the camera is focusing over and over again, wherever the square is aimed. And for video work, you may want to turn that off. I'll give some demonstrations on this in just a second. Usually turn my ISO to be something very specific because if you have changing lighting conditions, the camera will it'll change the brightness of the image. These are all just examples. So when we come into the Q mode here, we're given different sets of information. The focusing squares we'll talk about. Over here, we have our camera resolution settings. So we can come in here and choose from a huge number 
of different settings. You'll notice that it's highlighted in orange. You'll notice that we get the resolution, which is the width by the height of the image, the frames per second, and we also get this all I versus IPB. The short answer is all I. Think of that as all, all in. If you're a gambler, you're all in. What that means is that's a higher quality image from frame to frame. It's an individual image. Uh, larger file sizes. Look at the number, the amount of time left. Four minutes, 49 seconds when I'm shooting 4K, 30 frames per second. And when I go to IPB, it jumps up to almost 20 minutes, four times the file size. The, sh the longer answer, IPB, I use, I, as an acronym, I say I like peanut butter for my students to help them remember that this is a smaller sized file. The quality depends on the image you're shooting, but the way this works is it looks at the previous frame and the following frame, and the camera makes a calculation determine, determining what has changed. This is done to save file space. So in the other all I modes, it's, it's literally capturing 30 frames in a second. In the IPV modes, there's a calculation that's happening between each and every individual frame. It's processor heavy, uh, but it reduces file space size. That's, that's the gist of those two. And you can come down and you see all these, all these different options we have. We, we have standard 1080, Look at that light IPB, higher compression. See, the, the max time we can record video on the EOS R is 30 minutes. It has to do with designating a camera as a video camera or not. It's a, some sort of import tax thing. Most cameras, DSLRs, a lot of them are, are limited to 30 minutes of video recording. I'm going to leave it on 4K IPB for now. I'm going to come back out. We also have our headphone. Typically another better control back here is the microphone control. And we'll talk about that a little bit later is that we don't want any red. And that'll, if you see the red when you're using a microphone, it'll cut out the signal. Movie digital image stabilization is something I recommend staying away from simply because it, you lose resolution when this feature works. Essentially the camera is going to analyze it, zoom in and crop it out. It's something you can do in post. The correct way to deal with stabilization is to use a tripod and a fluid head, or maybe you're using a gimbal to get that smooth video look. It's something I talk about in my everything else crash course. So I'll be showing all those techniques. So that is an overview of the cue menu when we are shooting in video, come back to full HD. See how it jumps back, this is the crop mode. Toggling the info button we get a lot of the same information again. Here's our microphone audio levels. This is what I was talking about earlier. Very important to come in here and turn it from auto to manual. So what this means is that there, when we have a signal coming into the camera, if it's on auto, that means auto gain. That means if there's silence, the camera is going to adjust the gain to be louder. And then when somebody starts talking, it turns the gain down. And so you get this constant fluctuation. It's, it's maddening. Manual microphone control allows us to dial some of these settings back. Snap my fingers, still get a little bit of red there. But for the most part, we do not want to be in this range because we lose audio signal. If it's too low, we can turn it back up a little bit. If you want to record quality audio, you're going to need to get an additional microphone. The one in camera doesn't work as well because it also records anytime you touch the camera or move something. It's just not a really high quality sound, but this is where you'd come in and change your audio levels for video. Some of the other microphone settings you can see we have down here. The wind filter. I've never had any success with it, so I just turn it off. And then an attenuator, which dampens the sound. If it's enabled, just depending on what you're doing, see how the, the sound went down. It, it basically prevents the camera from going too wacky. I'll also turn that off. Quick side note I need to make is that earlier when we had just the auto recording level on, we didn't get the manual control here. The camera was taking care of it. Now we have that icon appearing. 
So I think now's a good time to start talking about exposure control. So I'm in video mode, info button. And the easiest way to start on this is to describe aperture priority mode. This is going to, going to demonstrate it pretty easily for us. Aperture priority mode, when we are in this mode, this means that we change the aperture I'm using the main command dial up here. You can see the aperture is changing. I can, this quick selection wheel does nothing right now. That just changes the aperture from f4 all the way up to f22. So the question you should be asking yourself is if we're changing the aperture size, we're reducing the, the amount of, of the light coming in, how come the exposure doesn't change? What's going on there? What's happening is the camera is adjusting the shutter speed for us behind the scenes. We can't see this. And definitely I'd recommend get your camera in hand and follow along. Take a picture of something. You're going to look at it and say, well, that looks a little bit dark. How am I going to make this brighter? This is where the exposure compensation bar comes in. If we touch this, if we touch on the bar itself, we turn it to one, come back out, take another picture. I'm going to play these back. So this is before, and this is with plus one. Even exposure, plus one exposure. And we're still at F4. So what's going on in the background? You see what happens here? 1 20th of a second. If we were to come back down, or yeah, let's come back down to even exposure. 1 40th of a second. So what's happening is the camera is changing the shutter speed. And that's the heart of the matter with aperture priority mode. We change the aperture and the camera adjusts the shutter speed. So I want to show you something pretty cool here. I'm going to tap the shutter button and then I'm going to take my hand and put it in front of the camera. Watch the shutter speed changes. So what's happening is the camera is measuring light in real time and it's going to make adjustments to the shutter speed in order to get an even exposure. So you may be wondering, what do these numbers mean? Plus one. Something I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to turn the ISO up, press the MFN button, I'm going to come over here, I'm going to turn this up quite a bit here. And when you are shooting in aperture priority mode, it is very important to sneak a peek at your shutter speed. I was at 1 40th of a second. Handheld, that's probably going to be blurry if I'm taking a picture of a portrait, for example. For beginners, I tell them 1 125th of a second is the shutter speed you should probably start at because people move. You move, your subject's going to move. So when you're shooting portraits, this is a good place to start. If you are shooting, let's say, sports, you may want this to be 1 500th of a second. We'll come back to that in just a second. But what's happening here is the camera in aperture priority mode changes the shutter speed. And you're not going to see it unless you've just touched the shutter button. These numbers over here, these refer to stops, which is the amount of light coming into the camera. This home base plate thing is an even exposure. And a plus one means plus one stop. Plus one stop means twice the amount of light. So let me show you something really cool. When we look at our shutter speed for an even exposure, it's one 125th of a second. If we were to change it to plus one, come back out, one 60th of a second. So if you're good with fractions, 1 125th plus 1 125th is 2 125ths, which if, if you divide that in half, it's almost 1 60th of a second. The camera's rounding. That's what's happening. So 1 60th of a second is twice as long as 1 125th of a second. The camera is leaving the exposure open twice as long. So if you're good at fractions, we're at 1 60th of a second. Let's come in here and go to two stops. What do you think the shutter speed's gonna be? If you said 1 30th of a second, you're absolutely right, because 1 30th of a second is twice as long. It's two times the duration of 1 60th of a second. If we were to come in to plus three, take a guess, what do you think it is? That's right, 1 15th of a second. And so that's the long answer on aperture priority mode is the camera's making adjustments to the shutter speed, even if 
you know, it would block the light. It's going to respect the exposure compensation selection. And it works the same in the opposite direction. Negative one, think about that. One, one twenty-fifth of a second. What's twice as fast as that? If you said one two-fiftieth, you're absolutely right. Come to two, tap shutter button, one five hundredth of a second. See, it's doubling. It's twice as fast. One one thousandth of a second. So that is how exposure compensation works. Most beginning photographers have no clue about it. Keep that in mind. There's that symbol, this little square with a plus minus sign on it. That means exposure compensation. And we can come in here, set it back to normal, and we're off to the races. So very common for me to shoot in aperture priority mode at plus one third of a stop, or maybe two thirds of a stop. I rarely shoot at plus one, just if I want a little bit brighter. Let's talk about some of the other modes. Come in here, let's go shutter priority. Shutter priority is different than aperture priority mode in that we designate the shutter speed and the camera designates the aperture. So watch what happens now when I cover the lens. Aperture starts blinking, it's not happy. Let's make this even worse. Let's say you're shooting an indoor sporting event and you're just gonna say, I need one 500th of a second. Tap the shutter button, you get this blinking again. Camera's not happy. When you see this, the camera's telling you it cannot open the aperture wide enough to get the exposure that you want. In this situation, what would you do? You gotta have one 500th of a second. It's a dark gym. Camera's not happy, camera's complaining, the images are dark. What would you do? If you said, come into our ISO, and bump the ISO up, you're absolutely correct. And in this case, now, when we tap the shutter button, we're at 5.6. Camera's happy. The camera's saying, this is the recommended aperture with the shutter speed, and if you shoot at this, this is the exposure you're going to get. The problem with ISO control is that as you increase the ISO, you're also increasing the amount of noise in the image. The EOS art is pretty good, even at 3200, 6400, you're gonna start seeing noise coming, and as you go higher, it's going to be more and more obvious. So, Again, all the rules apply here, except the changes are being made with the aperture. See how the aperture opened up wider? If you dial in plus one exposure compensation and jump back to aperture priority mode, it's remembered. So keep that in mind when you're jumping between modes. So real quick, let's talk about a couple of these guys. Dummy mode, lovingly called dummy mode, the green one, is I just tell all my students don't use it. It's turning your camera into a point and shoot, and you'll still benefit from the large sensor size, but most of the controls are limited and the camera's going to do pretty much everything for you. You know, if you're, if you're really super intimidated, this is probably where you're gonna start. I don't use the flexible priority mode because it's confusing for beginners, and you can do most of the things in flexible priority with greater control in aperture priority or manual mode. So I just, I just tell students, don't even worry about it. Program mode does have a purpose, and if you're ever going to use it, it's going to be with a speed light. If you're shooting an event and things are hectic and there's like rapidly changing lighting conditions, P mode with a speed light makes sense. Just depends on what you're doing, but I rarely use it. Manual exposure means that we dial in both the shutter speed and the aperture. We're given full control over the exposure settings. Come in here and dial this down a little bit. Maybe go with a faster shutter speed. See how easy it is to touch and drag the settings from the back monitor. Manual mode is great when you have enough time to inspect your settings, inspect the images, make the tweaks. Great for strobe use. Great for backlighted uh, portrait shooting. I use it on landscape shooting. For sports shooting and running gun types of things, I'm almost always on aperture priority mode. But you'll notice that the exposure compensation bar is no longer available for touch control. And that's because in the manual mode, this essentially becomes a light meter. It's telling, it's giving you an estimation about how bright or how dark the exposure is going to be. So if we were to use a very fast shutter speed, come back out and tap the shutter button, you see how it moved down? And it, it's just an indicator that's telling you, hey, this is gonna be a little bit dark. So that's an overview of the modes. We've talked about changing our image brightness, which is exposure control in the PS or A modes. We've talked about changing your aperture, your shutter speed in each of those modes. When you go into the mode control, 
We still have bulb. I demonstrated that earlier. Push and hold the shutter button down, release it. And then we have our custom user modes and it tells us the current mode that it's set up for. The way this works is that you come to a mode that you like. Let's say you're shooting an aperture priority mode and you have a certain white balance and you have all these settings dialed in. You know, you're shooting raw with this kind of JPEG and this kind of white balance and this kind of metering and this drive. All those things are all dialed in. We can come into our yellow tab. There it is. Custom shooting mode C1 to C3. We would come in here. We could register the settings and we would tell the camera to remember all those settings to C1. Tap the shutter button, come back out, push the mode dial, and you can see that it gives us the indicator that the change has taken place, and this is the custom mode that we're dialed into. Something I need to point out is that unfortunately we cannot dial this in for a movie setting. So if you wanted to have a movie mode on your stills mode, it's not going to let you do it. It still wants you to come in here and set it up. And so when you're in this mode, and you push the mode button, then we get the custom manual controls here on the bottom, which is where that would line up. So unfortunately we can't have a quick movie mode with our stills mode. So we have a very complex focusing system. And the easiest way to learn this is to think about it in terms of the how, the when, and the where. If you think of focusing this how, when, and where, this is going to be easy. Now most modern cameras are going to focus with a half shutter button depression. So as I push this down, you can see we get the green square indicating focus. Push it down all the way, it takes the picture. Most cameras operate that way. Because we have a touch screen, we can touch on the screen and also focus. We have a touch shutter enable, which means it'll focus and take the picture, which drives me crazy because every time you touch this in a shooting mode, it's going to take a shot. And then we can disable the touch shutter and still touch on the screen. See, so you get the red square when it didn't work. What it's looking for is it's looking for something to measure the contrast or the phase of the image to help it focus. If we're touching on areas that don't have anything in the frame for it to measure, it's confused. So, you know, things that are very low contrasty could be some problems. No problem focusing on the focusing square or the edge of the blinds. So next, let's talk about the when, whether this is a one-time focus or a continuous focus. We're going to come in to this mode right here, auto focus operation. One shot means is the camera is going to get focus lock. And, and as we hold the shutter button halfway down, we can even move the camera around and the focus will not change. No matter where we point the camera in, and in the olden days, that's funny with DSLRs is that's how we would get focusing for portraits. We would have a limited number of focusing square. We get a focus lock and we'd recompose because of the coverage that we have. It's almost edge to edge. Look at that. We don't have to recompose as much. You know, we can touch on our subject fire from there without re recomposing. That's great when you're using wide apertures, right? So that is one shot. If you're shooting moving subjects, you're probably going to want to go with servo mode. So if your kids are outside playing, running around, you're going to have more luck with the servo. See how it has the blue indicator. So when we push the shutter button halfway down and we're moving the camera, it is refocusing over and over and over again as long as we're holding the shutter button halfway down. Now this could be a problem when, when shooting sports because athletes run and they stop and you may want a different composition. So let's say this is our, let's say we're shooting a, a running athlete. She's running and we're shooting, shooting, shooting and she stops and then I see this great shot and I want to recompose. So I put her over here. This is the problem with front button focusing. My subject's here. The focusing square is over here. And so then I would have to, you know, move the focusing square. Now she's running. Oh, now you lost a shot. Great. That's when you would use back button focusing, which I demonstrated how to set up in the mode, the custom mode button feature right here. Come in here and customize our buttons and we could remove the auto focus from the halfway shutter button depression. So I push it down now, nothing happens. See that? Push the thumb button down and we get focusing again. 
Very important that if you do that is to remember to come in and change it back. If you don't do that, you'll be wondering why your camera isn't focusing if you're used to sh shooting with your halfway shutter button to press in the focus. So that is the win, whether it's one time or an over and over and over again. Now we're going to talk about the where the camera is focusing. This has to do with the camera's focusing clusters or focusing squares. It's in the top left-hand corner, auto focus method. There's a lot of options in here. We're going to start over here on this side. Large zone auto focus horizontal. You can tap the shutter button, come back out. You can see this box kind of looks at the middle of the frame. So the camera is just kind of looking at the scene and it's going to make its own decisions. It should be the closest subject to you, depending on what you're shooting in the subject matter, but it really likes this over here for some reason, which is strange because that is target mode, right? Let's take a look at these other options. And then we have large vertical zone. Just loves that left side for some reason. Let's see if we can. Okay, so not a lot of control about where focus is happening. Come back in. Zone AF, so if we come in here, you're going to notice we have a large zone that we can touch, tell it to look in that area. More refined control, a little bit smaller area. Then we have the single focusing squares, which is typically what the one that I use. It's telling us that if we toggle the info button, we can control the size of it. So there's a normal focusing square. We toggle it. Now we have a smaller sized focusing square. In the past, most cameras have joysticks or you know your directional pad will move it. It's just going to be a lot easier to touch on the monitor in order to focus. Even when we have the camera to our eye, we can designate different parts of the viewfinder to act as touch control to move the focusing squares. Let's come in and look at some of these other guys here. The expanded autofocus area gives the camera permission to look around that focusing square in the slightly different locations just outside of it and we can expand it even larger there it is so it really depends on the subject matter you're shooting if you're shooting sports this might be the one to go with it's a little bit larger square if it's not enough you would expand to be maybe zone just depends on what you're shooting so I had this model come in and help, handsome guy. Um, let's talk about face tracking, this face detection here on the very, very end. So the symbol is face detection plus tracking. And if we push the info button, we can get eye detection. Let me demonstrate each of these real quick. So you can see the white bounding box on our model's face as we pan to the left and right, pushing the shutter button halfway down. We get the green focus it locked takes the picture. Very good at tracking face. So if you're shooting, let's say a vlog, and you want your face to be tracked continually, this is the mode you're going to want. But if you don't want face detection, you want to track a subject, you can click on something and it's going to try to stay locked on that. It really depends on the subject matter and how much contrast there is there. Let's take a look real quick at eye detection. Here's the info, I, disable, push it, it's enabled now. Tap the shutter button. Maybe it's, maybe we're not close enough yet. There it is. So you can see that it's saying we're making the my left eye as we see it from the right eye. That's the priority for focus. And eye detection can be great when it works. It, it's amazing when it works because why? you know that the eye is going to be in focus. It's going to depend on obviously the shutter speed and if they're moving, you know, if, you're, if your settings are all dialed in and it's working, it's, it's amazing because you don't have to focus on the eye with a little teeny square. So that is eye detection. Something I should point out is that if we are in the video mode, let's come back up to our manual mode here. Many of these focusing tools have variations to them, such as servo autofocus. See how it's a little dark? No problem. Come in here, open the aperture a little bit. We can bump up our ISO. Very intuitive on, in terms of how to do that. But when you see this light, this little green dot with servo AF, what that means is the camera is focusing over and over and over again. 
And so as we, let's say, zoom in, zoom out, the camera is working to make sure that it is in focus. We turn this off, we zoom back. Now we're not in focus anymore if, if the person's moving. If you're doing a vlog, this is something you're probably going to want to have turned on. The tracking is very good on Cam Canon cameras, that dual pixel autofocus. It's top tier, top of the class. The only thing that comes even close is Sony's face tracking. Pretty much, so Canon's the best at it. It's, it's really amazing. But if you're shooting videos, there may be a reason you're going to want to turn that off. And there's different ways to use the modes. For example, if you're pulling focus, you may come in here and go with a one point autofocus. Pulling focus in the cinematic world simply means that you're shifting attention from one subject to the next. We turn that off and we can engage with the halfway shutter button depression. Let me demonstrate this with a closer target. So here's a better example of what pulling focus can do for you. In the past, you'd have to get a rig that you put on your lens and it's a person's job on a movie set just to be responsible for focusing the first assistant camera, first AC, right? So with servo AF turned on, watch how easy this is to pull focus. See how smooth that is, how nice that is? That's just awesome. So I could, you know, if I was a movie star, I could be looking at somebody, she's looking away from me, I'm like, hey, come back here, I love you, or whatever, right? And we'd tap on her and we'd see her reaction, and then she'd turn around and we tap back on me and then we live happily ever after, right? So that is how this tool is used cinematically is focusing, is telling the audience where to look in relationship to the story. If that is turned off, it'll still work, but we have to touch the shutter button halfway down. There are ways to customize some of the speeds and the autofocus will talk about that in the deep menu section of the video, but I just wanted to demonstrate some of these techniques for video, let's come, let's jump back out to regular shooting mode. Do it for stills as well. There's a great tool in here. I'm going to show you real quick. There's a couple great tools. What I'm going to do is flip the camera lens switch to manual. So now we're in manual focus. We get a range finder that tells us the distance at which the camera is focusing. There's this idea that you, you might think you have to jump in to autofocus with your lens to, to be able to change the focusing point. You do not. Keep it on manual focus and use the thumb button over here to toggle the focusing square. We can jump anywhere we want. Let's jump in and over here. And then when we press this magnifying glass, watch what happens. Punches in. And then we can get manual focus this way by looking at it. But there's a better tool that we can use if we turn it on. Most higher end video cameras have peaking focus. Auto focus, second tab, manual focus peaking settings. Peaking is a color overlay that measures the area of greatest contrast in an image. And the assumption is it's going to be in focus. It doesn't always work precisely, especially when you're using very wide apertures. But if we were to turn this on, we can choose high or low. We could also choose the colors. I like red. So I'm going to tap the shutter button, come back out, and you can see the red overlay here. If we were to want to look over here, dial this in, and we'll see the red peaking. There it is on my eyes. Doesn't work, unfortunately, when we zoom in. We seem to lose the peaking. That would be a great update in firmware. Canon, if you're watching or listening, it'd be amazing. So that is peaking, as well as manual zoom focusing. Let's talk about the camera's metering modes, which is the method it uses to measure light coming in to the camera. So we go into our quick menu, metering modes, it's fourth one down. If you're a pure beginner, kind of makes sense to leave it on evaluative metering. The metering modes work by us telling the camera what part of the screen to analyze. And in the evaluative, it's measuring pretty much the whole screen. The easiest way to explain this is in the spot metering mode. So we're going to tap the shutter button and you're, you're going to notice is that we got this, let me get this in focus real quick, is we got this little circle that appeared. What does that mean? 
That tells us the camera is measuring light specifically from that circle. So in the program mode, the shutter priority mode, and the aperture priority mode, this is when it's important. In the manual mode, it doesn't apply because manual, we dial those settings in ourselves. So take a look at the shutter speed right now. See how I'm focusing over here? And when I move it over a very bright light, watch what, watch what happens. The shutter speed changes. The camera's a little confused. And so what's going on here is the camera notices this bright light and says, hey, this is really, really bright. We're going to need a faster shutter speed. And it ignores the surrounding area. This can be pretty dang useful if you're shooting a model in the backlight. And so you might have sunlight coming over the corners or around her head. And, you know, if, if you want help from the camera, this is how you would do it. Now, there's some other modes in here, metering modes. We can go with a partial metering mode. Think of partial metering mode as a slightly larger area in the middle, and then center weighted would be even larger, and then evaluative is the whole screen. I really only use evaluative or spot, that's just me, but if you're in a backlit situation shooting aperture priority mode, you may want to play with this. It's a good thing to learn. So that is our metering modes. So if you're subscribed to my YouTube channel, we're going to have some tests coming, hopefully soon, where we'll demonstrate the servo focusing. So we're in servo, we're talking about a high speed burst. The frame rate changes depending on what other settings we have. If we have dual pixel raw in tracking, it's going to be limited to three frames per second. If you're using just the regular servo, let's come to a larger focusing square here. Listen about five frames per second. Let's turn this off, come in. I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna go into one shot. Listen, a little bit faster, eight frames per second. So if we come into tracking, I want you to listen to this as well. Remember this, and we'll go over here, face detection with tracking. Very hard to hear the difference, but that's three frames per second. And come back in, turn it to regular focusing square. It's about the same. So just keep that in mind is that you're going to get more frames per second if you're on one shot. And if you have your dual pixel raw turned on or you're tracking, it's going to be a touch slower. It may not be the best. So. Really depends on what you're shooting, but hopefully we'll have those tests coming to my YouTube channel. So with that in mind, we are ready to dive into the deep menu. Navigation in the deep menu is super easy by touching on the top tabs that have colors to them. Red is for shooting. Purple is the auto focus. Blue is playback. Yellow are the camera settings. Orange are the custom settings. And the green tab is the my menu tab, which allows us to save our favorite items to a single location makes it easier to find. We're not going to cover everything, but I'm going to try to cover the most important things in here. We've got a limited amount of time and there's like 20% of the things in here that are the most important. So image quality, we talked a little bit about. This is where we designate raw versus JPEG. Dual pixel raw, I recommend leaving it turned off in the tests with the 5D Mark IV. It doesn't really add a lot in terms of you know, features, it's kind of hard to process, it doesn't really give you a lot, so I just leave it turned off. Cropping and aspect ratio is allows us to determine how much of the sensor we're using, as well as the aspect ratio full for stills. 4K video is going to punch in anyway, automatically, but there may be some reasons you want to punch into a crop or use a one-to-one, -one, four to three, or a 16 by nine aspect ratio. If we touch the info, we can see the mast or the outline versions, depending on what we're doing. Image review, when you play back, how long do you want the image to be shown for? Two to eight seconds, or you can hold it. Release shutter without card, simply means that you want the camera shutter to work without a memory card in the camera. So we have the colored tabs, and we have pages within each of those tabs with these numbers. We can navigate using the directional pad up and down, but it's going to be faster and you got to be kind of precise by tapping like on the corner of your finger. Page two has to do with lens mistake correction. That's what aberration is a fancy word for saying mistake. 
peripheral illumination correction is when we're using wide angle lenses and get darkening in the corners. Distortion correction is a bowing effect that we get with wide angle lenses. And we have a, a digital lens optimizer. And so what this does, these three things do, is that Canon has built information into the software and it recognizes when we put on a certain lens that, hey, these are the corrections that need to take place. When you put on third-party lenses from other manufacturers, it doesn't have that information. It can't correct it. And so there are some real advantages, especially when you're shooting very wide for video and you get vignetting and distortion. These changes are very significant. That's not something you can easily do in post. So keep that in mind. External speed light control. Uh, we can come in here and change our speed light settings. And I actually have a speed light crash course on both the 580 and the new 600 EXRT. So if you do get a flash with your USR, check it out. And I recommend those settings are changed from the speed light. It makes more sense. Here's our exposure compensation bar. We talked about this in depth. This allows us to change it in the menu. We can go brighter or darker. And we also have the ability to do something called auto exposure bracketing by rotating the main command dial. We get these little tick marks. Bracketing tells the camera to take different exposures depending on where these settings are. So if we come out all the way, it's going to take one image that's underexposed by three stops, one that's evenly exposed, and then one that's overexposed by three stops. We have to push the set or the OK button. Bracketing is locked in. Watch the shutter speed change. Very quick between those. So we'll play them back, bright, dark, even. And that's what bracketing does. It tells the camera to change the exposure. It's great for landscape shooters or people who are dealing with HDR. Very useful. ISO speed settings. The important thing in here to keep in mind is we're looking for auto ISO. So the only time I use auto ISO would be for indoor sports. If I had a very specific shutter speed and aperture I wanted, I might turn it over to ISO, auto ISO, and let the camera deal with that, especially if there's changing lighting conditions. Otherwise, I'm dialing it in manually. It's habit. We can also set the range of our ISO speed in the range of our auto ISO speed, as well as the minimum or the slowest shutter speed available when using auto ISO. And I usually have that on auto, but if we wanted to dial it in, we could. There are all the settings. Auto light optimizer, we talked about it. It's an automatic contrast control that applies to JPEG only. I don't really use it. Highlight tone priority, also don't use. It allows the camera to shift the exposure a little bit based on the highlights in the frame. Metering timer is essentially how long the exposure settings would be displayed, for example, when we tap shutter button. So that'll disappear after a certain number of seconds. There it goes. So that's what that is. Exposure simulation is very important to turn on for most shooting situations. It's going to give us an exposure preview if you are shooting indoor strobe and you're adding, you know, flash, things of that nature, this might be something you're going to want to turn off because the camera can't calculate for that. It may be dark. You may not be able to see. So otherwise, I would say to leave it on. White balance we talked about, including custom white balance, how to set that up. White balance shift. We can also bracket it if we rotate this little... If we rotate the rear control wheel, we can bracket our white balance if we wanted to do that. I've never done that. Color space is going to be sRGB for most purposes, unless you're shooting for a magazine and you know you need Adobe RGB. Picture styles we talked about. These are the recipes that create JPEG images and tweak them in different ways. Let's keep coming here. Long exposure noise reduction. Anything over a second is considered a long exposure and sometimes there is noise associated with long exposures and we can turn this on if we wanted to we can go to oh, that's fighting me a little bit we can just turn it on or we could have it on auto so it kicks in when those long exposures happen again this is going to apply you know the, these two guys are going to, going to apply to jpegs raw images have the noise in there and you'd use your raw converter to clean it up
High ISO speed noise reduction is something I would definitely recommend leaving on standard. This is going to help clean up noise in high ISO JPEGs. Dust delete data allows us to choose an image that has it's like a speck of dust on it. I don't really use this because if I see sensor dust, I clean my sensor. That's the best way to do it. So this software solution, in all my years of shooting, I've never used it. If you see it on your images when you import them to Photoshop, you're going to clean them up anyway. Touch shutter, we, we showed the demonstration of how that works. You can touch on the monitor to take a picture. Multiple exposures is kind of fun. It's a little gimmicky. I don't really do it, but you can turn this on. And basically what it allows you to do is take multiple exposures. There's up to nine images and layer them in camera. And it's kind of cool. And here's the blending mode. You can do a lot of this in Photoshop. So it's not something I really use a lot, but it's fun to play around with. Let's turn it and see we lose a bunch of menu items when we have it turned on come back out. HDR can be a really cool tool if there is nothing moving. So if you're shooting trees blowing in the wind, grass, things of that nature, uh, you're going to have ghosting effects. If things are still, it's, it's a really great quick way to get a high dynamic range image. And so we can come in here and change the values for how much exposure shifting. Do you want this to be for one image or for many images? Do you want it to align? Do you want to save the source images? This is really nice because it, you can go in and maybe find an image that was better, you know, by itself without the ghosting. So it's it's fun to try out. You know, the, the sunsets are good here in Hawaii, and that's typically where I would use it to, to test it out. Page six, we have a bulb timer. Remember when I showed you bulb, it was to push the shutter button, starts the exposure, releasing it, ends it. If you just wanted to push and release, you would hit enable and you could come in and set a timer that would designate when the exposure would end. Kind of nice. We don't want that on. Anti-flicker shooting. Again, this is with the flickering lights. It's going to help the camera time when the, the shutter actually fires away. Silent shutter, if you want completely silent shooting. Very nice. Uh, it uses an electronic shutter, so if you're panning, you may see some warping. It's a, kind of the jello effect as the camera is scanning the image down. Cannot use it with a burst or flash photography. Let's leave that turned off. So silent live, live view shooting. So if you're using the back monitor, there's different silent live views. High speed display. And we come in here, it's grayed out. It says it's not available because of your drive mode in your AF operation. So sometimes you'll see menu items grayed out. Let's come back into aperture priority. So when we turn this on, when you're in a burst mode and you're shooting a moving subject, this is going to make it easier for, for us to track the moving subject when this is turned on. If it's turned off and you have a moving subject, it may be a little bit harder. Try it out. So that's the first tab, which is the red tab. Purple tab is for focusing. Many of these items we, we have already in the Q menu, so we can determine server or one shot. The focusing squares are there. The frame size and eye detection we, we demonstrated earlier through the quick menu. Continuous autofocus, I would recommend leaving it off. This is a pre focusing, which when you turn it on, even if you're on one shot, it's going to be kind of pre focusing. Here, I'll show you real quick. Turn it on. Let's come into one shot. So See that shouldn't shouldn't really be happening. It's going to be focusing on everything. Not a huge fan of it. Turn that off. Touch and drag auto focus settings. These are kind of important because when your eye is in the viewfinder, you might want to have some control over those focusing squares. It's kind of hard to demonstrate as we're you know looking on the back here, but you can see on the back monitor it gives you access to different parts of the viewfinder. Top right, for example and it would allow us to touch and drag and move the focusing squares around. So we can have it relative or absolute, probably relative, and that is how that works. And so I, I can't really show it because you know, the monitor is turned off, but if you are frustrated moving your focusing squares, this is something you're going to want to try out. 
for the second page. Peaking focus, we've already talked about. Focus guide, that's the little, there it is. You see this on higher end cinema cameras. These little tick marks as they move closer to the middle one. See how they kind of flip up? Those are peaking. So it's another focusing tool, very handy. Let's turn that off. Tracking sensitivity, remember this is going to deal with photo mode. So we can change the sensitivity at when tracking kicks in, the acceleration of it, and the autofocus point switching. For the beginning, I would recommend not worrying about this. If we have enough time, I'll briefly show you some of the items for the moving set, movie setting. I'll just show you real quick. So let's come in here, info, movie, come back. In. So I'm in movie mode and you can see the movie servo tracking and sensitivity has changed. There's a few menu items in here that are different when you are in movie mode. So page four, lens electronic manual focus means that after we focus with auto focused, you want the ability to use the manual focusing ring. Disable after one shot means is that after you get the focusing lock, you can use your manual focusing ring. One shot enabled means is if, if we hold the shutter button halfway down, then we can rotate the ma manual focusing ring and then focus. One shot enabled magnified means we're going to not only be able to focus, but it will also zoom in on the image as we hold the shutter button halfway down, and then we can disable it all together. Autofocus assist beam has to do with speed lights. So when you put a, a flash speed light on our camera, it's going to assist in, in the focusing. This is asking, do you want the camera to prioritize focusing or releasing in one shot mode? And I would say, leave this on focus. Lens drive when autofocus is impossible essentially means what do you want the camera to do if you cannot attain focusing lock? Do you want it to keep on searching or do you want it to stop? Limit the number of clusters available. You can come in here if, if you never use, I don't know, this large autofocus zone, turn it off, turn off a couple of them. It just depends on what kind of shooter you are and what options you want available. Orientation linked autofocus point. I kind of like this one turned on simply because what this means is the camera is going to remember your last focusing square. If you were in landscape, it's going to be one, and as you rotate it to portrait, it would jump back and forth between those two focusing squares, the position of them. Initial servo AF for face detection and tracking. I just leave this on automatic. There's some ways you can tweak this, and it's asking how do you want to start the initial tracking in the beginning. I think auto's fine. So that's the purple tab. Now we're getting into playback. I'm going to skip through a lot of this pretty quickly. Protecting images allows us to assign a little key icon by pressing the set button, and that will protect it and prevent it from being deleted. It does not protect it from formatting. We can also do it for a range if we want to do it quickly. We can do all the images in a folder. We can unprotect all the images in the folder. We can protect all the images on a card. We can unprotect them all as well. Rotate images. Obviously, if we want to rotate an image, this is how we could do it. We come in here, press the set button. It's going to rotate it tall, upside down. There it is. We can erase images. We can print from our camera with compatible printers. Typically, we have to connect physically. Photo book setup. This is going to allow us to select images and create a photo book from it. It's kind of gimmicky. Image transfer would allow us to send images to computer something I've never used and most photographers aren't. Typically I use the card, you know, if I'm going to transfer it to my computer. Raw image processing, not a huge fan of it, but it's going to give us some options to process raw images in camera. If you want to, we can crop, meaning cut out parts of the image. We can resize, we can rate images. This is probably, you know, what I'm going to, going to use. There's a way to set up a customization button to rate images a little bit faster if you're into that thing. We can play a slideshow of our images come in here. You, it's, right now it's set to all the images and we can set this up. How long do you want them to show? Do you want it to repeat or loop? You want to transition? You take an HDMI cable, plug it into a monitor, hit start. We used to do it at weddings. 
you know, we'd shoot the ceremony and, and then play back images at the reception. Set image search conditions allows us to find an image that maybe we took a couple days ago. We can't, we have 10,000 images on our card. We come in here and search by date. We could choose a folder, protected or unprotected video versus stills. And what this is gonna do is it's going to show us the, the images played back. Make sure you turn this all off when you're done. So to be clear, when you select something, so I, I put this card in my Fuji camera, shot some images and there's a different folder. So when you designate what you want the camera to be looking in by any of these criteria and you hit OK, it'll give you a warning. But when you come back, back out and play those images, it'll only be looking at that criteria that you designated. So it's kind of cool, but just keep in mind that if you if you set this up and you don't remember you're going to be wondering where your pictures are, right? We can also jump with our main dial. This is where we designate how we jump, whether it's one image, 10 images, images that we designate, the date, the folder, the movies only, stills only, protected images, and rated images. I think 10 is probably pretty good. Page three, playback information display. So when you're playing an image back, what do you want to be displayed? If this is too much, you would deselect some of these and it would not be displayed. Highlight alert, when this is turned on and you're overexposed, you're going to see some flashing black and white over the area that has lost all the information. It's anything that's overexposed, basically. Auto focus point display will tell the camera to display, at least on playback, where the focusing square was. Sometimes that helps people learn how to use their focusing squares. We can have a playback grid. So if you wanted to see one of these grids during playback, also an overlay that is not on the actual picture. Movie play count. If you're playing a movie back, how do you want the time code display? View from last scene essentially means do you want to view the last image that you looked at or do you want to continue to look at images that you're currently shooting? I leave it to disable. This magnification feature allows us to determine how much we're zooming in during playback. So the touch con controls for playback are great. If you wanted a grid display of the images, we can zoom in, zoom out. This is how I do it. You know, so we can zoom in and out, touch and drag through very fast, very easy to navigate through our images this way. If there was an image that we liked, double tap on it. Here it comes. Pinch and open the fingers. We can zoom in. For me, that's e far easier than you know, hitting the magnification button and then punching in a certain amount. So that is your blue playback tab. Now we're getting into the camera settings. We have the ability to select which folder we are shooting with. Selecting the folder that we're using allows us to choose where the images are stored on the memory card. You can see I've used this in my Fuji camera. And so it kind of differentiates different shoots. If you had a, two shoots in a day, you can put them in different folders. If you wanted to create a new folder, it's right there. File numbering has to do with what you want the camera to do with the file numbers. When we replace the memory card, do you want it to continue? It's typically what I have. Or do you want it to reset to 0001? We can come in here and designate different file names. So if we wanted to use image, change type in a different name here. It's really up to you. Auto rotate is something I recommend leaving on. Camera will recognize when we go to the portrait mode versus the landscape mode, and will automatically rotate on playback. Formatting your memory card is going to erase everything, including protected images. And typically, when you put a new card in or you want to erase everything, this is a good place to do it. Just make sure you have two backups when you format your cards. If you have one backup, it's probably going to lose some images. Eco mode is an economy shooting mode if you want to save battery power. Power saving features is when do you want the camera to turn off? So the display, the auto power off for the whole camera or the viewfinder you can separate each of these and determine when they shut down. Display brightness, come in here, change the brightness of the image in terms of the play. It's not the exposure, it's just the display. The color tone, we can also tweak it to be different hues of yellow or blue. We have our date and time which you set up when you first got the camera. Language being used. Look at all the different languages. 
for the menus. It's really impressive. It's the most of all the camera companies, Canon is has the most translations for the menu controls. It's freaking amazing. So the video system designation, if you're on PAL, you'll designate it. If you don't know what PAL is, you're probably NTSC. Touch control has to do with the sensitivity of the touch monitor. Do you want it to be standard or do you want it to be really sensitive or do you want to turn it off? The beep bothers some people, so we can turn it off for the touch screen only or we can turn it off altogether. Battery info will tell you about how much charge you have on your current battery, the recharge performance and the number of images taken so far with that particular battery. Sensor cleaning, this is going to do one of two things. There's an auto cleaning feature. We can designate auto cleaning to happen when we turn the camera off, when we turn the camera on or off, or we can disable it completely. Let's leave it on off for now. We can designate it to clean now, wood, and then we can clean manually. This would give us access to the sensor and remove really stubborn dust specks. I talk about this in my everything else crash course and kind of go through the techniques that I use. Some are better than others. I've seen people mess up their sensors because they didn't know what they were doing. So you can, I'll show you how to do that on the everything else crash course. HDMI resolution. So an HDMI recorder is a monitor that we can attach, affix to the top of the camera we can feed a cable into it. The resolution, we can designate it as 1080 or tell the camera to automatically detect. HDMI HDR output essentially means that we can display and view raw images on our monitors or TVs when we're playing back through the camera. So if you turn this on, you it'll allow you to play the raw images on your monitor. So page four of the yellow tab, all this has to do with how information is displayed. So if we go into shooting info display, we can designate which screens we want available, for example which settings, see how they're appearing on the toggle, the different types of information. So you, I, I just leave it the way it is when I get it, but if you don't want all this information, you can come in here and turn them off. If you go vertical, do you want that displayed? Do you want a grid display? Here are the different grids. Architectural shooting can help. Histogram, do you want brightness or RGB? Do you want it to be large or small? There's just so many ways to customize this. The focusing distance in manual mode for example. Display performance, do you want it to be smooth or do you want to save some battery power? So many options. Do you want, look at the look at the exposure settings on the bottom, or do you want it to be a little bit cropped? I like display one. There's, so you can come in here and really toggle pretty much everything you want, like that on auto, and then the help text is small, or if you can't see it, you can go with standard. So those are display settings. Wireless communication settings has to do with Wi-Fi. If we have enough time, I uh, will show you how to set that up. Really great. GPS device settings, we don't have built-in GPS. If it was turned on to a GPS re receiver, we could set this up. It's asking for the receiver, it's not there. There is, you can also connect with a smartphone if you really wanna do that through the app when we do the Wi-Fi stuff. Just disable this for now. The multi-function lock, what do you want this to lock? When you push this lock button up here, do you want it to lock both control wheels, the touchpad, and you can determine that yourself. Custom shooting mode, we de demonstrated this earlier. This is how we register custom shooting modes for C1, C2, or C3. We can clear and auto update. So if you will turn this on and you're shooting on C1 and you change your settings, do you want it to update automatically? Usually you don't want that, so stable there. We can clear all our camera settings if we wanted to. Copyright information, if you wanted to embed your name and your copyright into the files, you can do that here. So there's a manual for a QR code if you wanted to check that out. Certification logo displays. The firmware, this tells us we're shooting with the first firmware of the camera. If Canon comes out and says, hey, we have a new firmware update, we could compare it here and know which one we have currently. Same goes for the lens. So there's a way to update that software. So that's the yellow tab. Now we're getting into the orange tab and there's so much information in here. Look at this, six pages of custom controls. So we're gonna skim through these pretty quick. Some of these are great, some of these you'll, you'll never change. Most of them you'll never change. 
Exposure level increments. Do you want to change by one third or one half stops? Mine is one third for both of those. Yes, we want bracketing to cancel after the first set. If you don't like that, you can change. So the zero on this is an even exposure. The negative is an underexposure, and the positive is an overexposure. And this is the order in which the bracketing shoots. How many bracketed shots is it you want? Two, three, five to seven. Safety shift I never use. Essentially gives permission to the camera to shift the exposure just a little bit. Just don't use it. I just use exposure compensation in manual. Same exposure for a new aperture. This is a great way to get confused. Stick with what I showed you in aperture priority mode. If you come in here and enable this, it's going to give permission to the camera to change either your ISO or your shutter speed or both of them, depending on what mode you're in. It's just better to learn how to control the camera with exposure compensation, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. We can set our shutter speed range. Highest shutter speed for a mechanical shutter is one eight thousandth of a second. We can set our aperture range. What kind of exposure lock do we want after focus? Right now it's set to evaluative. How do the dials work? Do you want to change the direction that they go in when you rotate one direction or the other? So if you're rotating left to right, you may want to reverse the direction. That goes for the dial control, the control ring rotation, the focus ring rotation, and the manual focus sensitivities. There's different ways we can control those. Customize buttons. We already talked about this a little bit. We have this overlay that really takes us through the all the different buttons on the camera we can customize. Very nice. We can customize our dials. We also talked about that. Lots of options. We can customize the touch bar. This is where it happens. We can assign this to be a number of things, ISO speed. So this double arrow means dragging back and forth, and then this single half highlighted bar means tapping directly on the sides. Unfortunately, I'm just not a huge fan of the touch bar. It just gets in my way, so I leave it turned off. It's not assigned. And then we can clear the customization settings, all of them. Page five, add cropping information is going to give us an overlay in the viewfinder when we're shooting. You can see it here are these bars. I'll toggle this on. You can see, so it kind of gives us a guide in terms of when we're shooting. Turn this off. The default erase option is that when you hit that garbage can icon, what do you want the default to be set on? Cancel, this is what I recommend, or erase. Okay, and the problem with erase is, is if, if you hit the garbage can icon and bump something else, it's gone. The cancel requires you to move the, the cursor over. So we hit cancel, see, it's on, see how it's highlighted on cancel? Now we have to go here to erase. That's the safety part of it, and some people don't like that and they want to delete them faster, and they want the default to be on the erase, the RAWs or JPEGs, just depending on what it is. Release shutter without lens. I don't really use that a whole lot, So, but if you want to release the shutter without your lens on, this is where you'd come do this. Retract lens when power off. I don't have a lens that will do this automatically, so it kind of gives me a little bit of information. There may be some lenses coming that will automatically retract when we turn the camera off. We can add IPTC information. Obviously, you don't have any, so I'm going to leave that off as well. And you can also clear all of your custom functions. So if you go in there and change a bunch of things and you don't know what you did, you can reset it. So we've talked about a lot of menu items. and the truth of the matter is you're only going to use a couple. So we're going to add something to the My Menu tab. We can come in here. So now we have My Menu. Let's come in here and select Items to Register. And basically gives us everything that we've covered to appear, depending on which one we want, on our My Menu tab. Look at all this stuff. Looking for format card. Why? Because I use the format card feature a lot. And, we'll, and so when we come back out, come back out, there it is. So I have two tabs now. I added a tab and now I can format the card 
come into this feature. It says, hey, you're going to lose all your information. And that makes it very quick and easy to go to the settings that, you know, the three or four settings that you might actually use. And so it's in the order of what you see, image quality. If we really wanted that, we could go select it and there it is. And so, you know, you scroll through the list. It takes some setup time, but over the, over the life of your camera, it's going to save you so much time. We can come into edit the tabs. We can delete all the My Menu tabs. We can add another tab. We can delete all the items in the tabs. We can display it from My Menu. So when we turn the camera on, do you want to jump to the My Menu tab? Do you want to only display from the tab? These are all features to really save you time. It takes a little it takes a little bit of time to set up. When we have multiple items in there, we can change the position of them. We can delete items delete all of them from a certain tab, rename the tab. It's really nice. Lots of different ways to set this up. So that is the My Menu tab. Something I wanted to do real quick for you guys, because I know there'll be some questions. Let me demonstrate some of the changed features when we jump into a movie mode. So we come into movie mode from here, hit the menu button. And then in the very beginning, you see we have, we don't have quality. We have resolution for video. We have you know, things like movie cropping and the sound rate and the time code. So if you are a videographer, you know, if you're a beginner, I'd just say leave it here. But if you wanted to change your count up, whether it's recording or free run, you know, all these things are in here. Start the time setting. There's so many different ways to, you know, deal with the, the video files. And that has a separate menu. This is something I really wanted to point out. Again, not a huge fan of the digital image stabilization we have the lens aberration corrections, very important for video. And, and that's probably why you're going to want to stick with Canon lenses, especially the wide angle ones, is to avoid the vignetting and distortion with this software correction. A lot of the similar things that we talked about, some of these are a little bit different. So in auto and aperture priority mode, we can go with eight stop increments. A lot of pretty cool options. And some of these are very similar. But this one here is important, Canon Log Settings. If you don't know about the video menu, you're not going to be able to find it, but it's on page, the red tab, page 4. If you want to get involved with the Canon Log, there's 8-bit and there's 10-bit. So if you are shooting HDMI out with an HDMI cable to an HDMI recorder, you just can't do it on card, you can record in a very high-quality Canon Log which is going to capture a greater dynamic range. It's going to be a lot more color information. And it's really for grading. So if you're doing any high-end video work that you know you're going to want to color grade, this is where you would set it up. Gives us some information. Very powerful feature here. It's probably one of the cooler, best features of this camera. You know, the, the Canon logs that we see on the higher-end cam, uh, video cameras are very expensive. You know, this is, you know, six to $10,000, depending on where you get them and how used they are. HDMI display. So do you want it to, to display on the camera as well as the HDMI? You can put it on the HDMI only. Some of these things are very similar to what we what we saw in the stills. So if we wanted to have movie servo auto focus, we saw that already. Let's see if there's anything else different in here. Here's something that's different. What do you want the shutter button to do? Halfway depression, go to meter. Fully depress, start and stop video recording. Let's see what else we got. Wi-Fi, trying to, trying to get to that Wi-Fi lesson. Customizations. A lot of this is similar. Yep. And so the, the meat for the video shooting is going to be in this red tab and then also the sensitivity speed that you can change for tracking. It's on purple tab, page three. So that is a quick overview of the deep menu system. I know there's a lot of information. I'd like to get into the Wi-Fi next. So the first thing you need to do to connect with Wi-Fi is download the Camera Connect Canon app from the App Store, whether it's the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. You need to have it, otherwise this isn't gonna work. Come into our menu, yellow, tab, page five, wireless communication settings. We're going to turn this to enable. That is going to tell the camera to send out a Wi-Fi signal. For security, I recommend this, but you may not always need it. 
We have a connection history. We can also send a computer, but we're going to focus on the basic setup for now. The Wi-Fi functions, if you want to, you know, register a nickname to identify it, you can. We're going to want to connect with our smartphone. Register the device. It's going to be iOS. So there's different ways we can do this. We can come in here with a QR code. Or likely, you're going to come into your Wi-Fi settings. So it's telling us the name of the Wi-Fi connection and the password. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come into my camera settings. So I've, I've come into my Wi-Fi. I'm currently connected to my personal network. And here's the camera network right here. It's asking for the password, which is given to me right here on the bottom. So I would type this in, 2, 1. And so the password is going to prevent other people from joining your camera network and seeing your images, for example. Once we get a confirmation that we're connected, we're going to jump back to the app. Here it is. New camera found. Select the camera to connect to. It's pretty painless once you've figured this out, how to do it. So it's wanting us to hit OK. That is going to establish the connection. And then we get all these great things you know, that were grayed out before and they're now available to us. So there's a few cool things to do with this. Uh, let me show you the best, which is the live view shooting. Really cool because we can operate the camera remotely. See, I'm touching on the screen. This may, might be a little bit laggy. We can take a picture, pushing the shutter button. You can see the, the Wi Fi is working over time here. We can also change the display. We can come in here and change our ISO settings. We can change things like our aperture, shutter speed. I'm in the manual mode right now, obviously. We can change our white balance, the focusing cluster, the drive mode if we wanted to go with, let's say, a timer. We can dial in the manual focus if we want to go a few steps forward or back. I've never seen this on an app before. This is pretty cool. Let's come back to our drive mode, single shot. There's a little bit of lag sometimes I'm noticing, but for the most part, it looks to be working fantastically. We have number of shots remaining, battery. We have some settings up here. We can show the auto focus button if you just want to focus and not Take a shot. See that? It's a little laggy sometimes. We can display the images that we've taken. Very cool. And we also have up here the video mode. Just want to make sure we got everything. Yep. We can switch it over to video mode. The ironic thing about this is it's easier to switch in video mode from the app than it is from the camera. Look at this audio levels on the app. That's awesome. We can come down, can we change any other settings? Some minor stuff, touch autofocus. We can't change our exposure settings in the movie mode, but we can video record. We get the designator over here. Pretty nice, pretty cool. Stop recording. Come in, there it is. So there are some limits there in terms of what we can do. I love the app. The app's great. There's a few things we would want, but it doesn't kick us out of Wi-Fi when we leave live view shooting like some other apps do for other companies. We can take a look at the images on the camera. These are all the test shots we've been firing, including video. So the cool thing about this is that we get a preview of the images on the camera and we can download these guys if we want, if we want to see so many. We've got different grid displays, depending on how many images we want to see. We can see EXIF data, shutter speeds and the apertures. So this is great if you know if you had a long shoot and you're driving maybe home on a bus or an airplane and you don't want to get your camera out, turn the Wi-Fi on, you scroll through your images. We can scroll through it by date. Very nice. Change the ordering. We can filter date range and file types, stills or movies. Really, really nice. This is good. And, it, and of course, if we want to download our rate, so we can download the image. Do you want it 
to be a reduced size, a smaller size. If you're posting on social media, you may not need the full size, but you may want the full size. You want to back up some of these images. You can do that. So it's saving the, the reduced size image. We can open it in a photo app. Lots of very nice options. We can give it a star rating. How cool is that? We can send it to a printer. We can delete it, or we can just do a quick download when we see it. That's what this should be right here. Oh, it's, this is saying it's downloaded. I think that's what it's saying there. Yeah, so when, we, when we're playing back and we see this little icon, it's saying you've downloaded this image. Again, our EXIF data. Very nice, tons of things to do in here. Let's come back out to the main menu. We can set up an auto transfer. So as we're shooting, we just flip this on. If the Wi-Fi is connected, it'll automatically download them to your phone. I don't use it. If we're using the GPS feature to embed location data with the files, we can also delete that from the image, okay? Just because if you share it, there are ways to pull that data off. Keep that in mind. If you have GPS data in your, embedded in your image and you share that, the full image, there's ways to access that and people can find your location. So this is saying, do you want to delete the location data when you download it to your phone? So let's talk about location information. There's no GPS unit that comes with the camera. There's an additional device we can use con to connect but if you wanted to embed location data, this is where you would come in and say, start recording location. So as you're shooting, it's gonna embed this information into the EXIF files of the images. And it's sort of a workaround using your smartphone if you don't wanna buy the GPS device. I don't really use it, but if there is a need, this is where it would happen. Lastly, we have our camera settings. Do you want it to reflect the date and time of the smartphone? Let's sync it. Pretty nice. So a couple other things we have in here. Bluetooth, I'm not a huge fan of using. It just, it's not as stable, it seems. But you can connect by Bluetooth. And that's how we can disconnect. So Canon, if you're watching, you know, a few recommendations in here. It looks great on the stills part. On the video part, we would love to have more exposure controls for video mode. Surely that's coming. It's one of the more polished Wi-Fi apps for cameras. So that is an overview of the Camera Connect app and how to connect by Wi-Fi with your EOS R. So let me make some accessory recommendations for your new EOS R. At the time of this recording, there's only two native mount lenses available, the 24 to 105, which appears to be outstanding, and the 50 millimeter 1.2. There's a 28 to 70 F2, it's coming, it's very expensive, and a 35 millimeter 1.8 macro. So only four lenses in the, in the immediate future for native focusing, and there is a huge amount of Canon compatible EF lenses, which are the lenses that work on Canon's DSLR cameras. So the number one accessory without a doubt is the EF to R mount adapter. Even the simple one, there's two advanced ones that are coming that have a control ring and drop in ND filters or polarizers. Those are a little bit more expensive, they're coming. But even the basic, most standard adapter is a must have because you can take something like the 50 millimeter 1.8, the Nifty 50, it's a, it's a hundred dollars, 120 bucks or something like that. That's a great portrait lens. So yeah, that adapter is going to give you a huge amount of options until more native lenses come out. Tripod, invest some money into a good tripod. I like the Bogan Manfrotto B Freeze or the Mi Photo Tripod, something that has a ball head that locks. Some of them are as low as 120 bucks. I'm not a fan of the Walmart <laughs> tripods, the flimsy ones, they break too easy and that money's just better invested elsewhere. If you are going to be shooting video, keep in mind the 4K stuff is cropped. You can use your EFS lenses on the mount as well. You don't have to worry about the mirror flipping up. And you know, there's a lot of recommendations I can make. You know, the microphones, you're going to need something good for video recording. Rode has a huge lineup of video microphones for DSLRs. Uh, I'm wearing a lav mic right now, Sennheiser E100 G3, favorite lav mic of all time. But if you're interested in all the available accessories that you can get, I am going to list them on my gear bag. So if you go to michaelthemaven.com, there's a gray button there that says Michael's gear. For every camera, every lens that I've ever used or owned, it's all listed there, the accessories for video, so on and so forth, and it has a direct link where you can find the product 
If you've enjoyed this video and you've learned something about your camera, but you're still struggling with the basics of photography, I'm thrilled to let you know I have an everything else you need to know about your camera crash course. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this tutorial of the EOS R. We have some tests coming in terms of performance to see how it measures up against its current rivals. So if you want to see those videos, hit the subscribe button and I will see you next time. Good luck and take care.